Uh, our last speaker, I don't think I really have to introduce him, but I will. It's Jake Tibbles from the Thousand Islands Land Trust. Jake has worked for over 17 years to conserve and manage some of the most treasured landscapes in the Thousand Islands. He's the executive director at the Thousand Islands Land Trust since 2012, and he has overseen a whole lot of really great things at Tilt. Um, Tilt is one of our favored and best and closest partners, so really looking forward to this. Join me in welcoming Jake. The same muskies come back to the same places over time. It's believed that they go back to the places they were born. So places like Vine Bay fulfill that, that life cycle. Because it's such a sacred, special, biological gift to this region. In the mornings, it's nothing to see, you know, these bitterns, American bitterns, hanging out in the marsh, uh, great blue herons, you know, wading along the shoreline, fishing. Um, you know, you've got the common terns, which are listed as New York State threatened species. You know, they're, you know, flying overhead looking for, for that next meal to feed their young. You get the loon calling in the background, and then, you know, before too long, a kingfisher um, has that, just that iconic sound along the shoreline. Um, you know, really, it is, it is still a sanctuary for uh, an incredible amount of, of wildlife. So even though the muskie is like such a large, voracious predator with big teeth and it, it starts life as a really sensitive animal. <laughs> so their, their eggs are like the size of a crossman BB. Uh, they don't build a nest, they're broadcast spawners, so they, they produce a, a lot of eggs and they distribute them around. And so then that egg is what we call demersal. It sinks to the bottom and it's at the mercy of the environment at that point. It has a yolk that it absorbs that it got from its, its mother. And they don't go that way. You release a bunch of small muskies, they don't go that way. They go that way. They go right into the marsh and they stay in that bog and it's a big nursery. They're just fascinating animals. They become predators early in life. When you lose a sight, these muskies are unable to complete their, their life cycle. First thing that happens is the government has to propose a project. CBP wants to build an industrial style facility. It was a site that was proposed for development by Border Protection. So they proposed a project to build in Blind Bay. As we learn more and more about it, like there was a pretty large facility. Upwards of 50,000 square foot of industrial facility. There would be dog kennels and permeable surfaces for up to 100, 125 vehicles. There's going to be a lot of light pollution. They do what's called a FOSI. This is a you know, happy days. It's a finding of no significant impact. And that's what they came out with initially, which was absurd. It's a, an environmentally sensitive area. There are 52 different species, aquatic species, that use that particular stretch of the river. Blind Bay wetland is one of the few high quality wetland environments that still exists along the mainland. You know about the light problem at the border now. You should take a hard look at what we already have. The CDP just built a quarter billion dollar facility that's empty. We already see in T.I. Park the glow from the border station. From humans down to the tiniest zooplankton is affected by light. Breathing is affected. Their ability to parent properly is affected. Their ability to know when it's time to migrate or to migrate safely is affected. And that has been an ongoing battle with Customs and Border Protection just to address the light pollution that's emitted from, from the port of entry. And the facility that's being proposed in, in Blind Bay, it's not just the light pollution that we're gonna be dealing with. In order to get the boats that CBP plans to use in this area in and out of here, they're gonna to have to come in and dredge or suck out the river bottom. When it's done in a, a high quality coastal wetland environment, it kind of removes native sediments where invertebrates live, uh, resting eggs of zooplankton. All the propagules that contribute to the development of native aquatic vegetation. And it can cause what I would describe as a redistribution of legacy toxins. You know, the typical ones that we hear of are 
mercury and PCB and other aspects of the ecosystem are, are disturbed at a pretty extreme extent. You know, it changes the depth gradient, um, so you don't get that natural uh, sloping transition that you would normally see in a wetland. Lime Bay can't be remade by people. We can't convince muskies that that is a spawning spot after you've dredged where they spawn. You start messing with the nursery and you mess with the adults and you mess with the adults and you mess with the fishery. If you look at dollar for dollar the revenue that having that moniker nationally brings to the entire St. Lawrence River Basin, you're taking an actual double digit percentage of what people come up here looking for right off the table. Why would you harm this beautiful place? You know, um, everybody is out trying to do things, and there are a lot of crazy things going on, but the river is not crazy. I think it's important that this community has its voice listened to. It's an ecosystem that can't be replaced. It's just that simple. And if they annihilate it, you've lost a major, important, Upper St. Lawrence River, Jeb. But there's something beyond the numbers. There's the thing that just, you know, the thing that strikes you um, that you're not being a good steward of the river. Whether it's light, whether it's development, whether it's pesticides, whether it's how we plant our gardens, we really do owe it to be thoughtful in every step we make protecting and preserving those areas is really important, not just for right now, but in the long run. Like, what we'll think of this event in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years. You know, did we protect the area and preserve it for the future, or did we develop it? The, the muskie is part of the, the lore and mystique of the river. It's part of our history. You know, it continues to this day uh, to be a really important and unique part of the Upper St. Lawrence ecosystem. It's a wonderful river, yeah, and we need it. Before I get into my presentation, um, the president of Save the River, Rick Gregoire, also co-owner and operator of Northern Marine, um, is going to say a few words on behalf of Save the River in uh, John's absence. I think I put just put uh, Rick on the spot. So. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Welcome to the 2024 uh, Winter Environmental Conference update uh, on Save the River, or on Save by Blind Bay, excuse me, and other river communities <clears throat> from CBP's proposed plan to construct a new facility on the river frontage. <clears throat> During recent communications with elected officials, it has become apparent that U.S. Customs and Border Protection officials are confusing a willing seller of riverfront property with community support. The river community, as evidenced by over 2,200 petition signatures, emails, 
letters to the editor, and other protestations, remains adamantly opposed to the siting of CBP's new facility in Blind Bay or other river residential areas. Thousand and Land Trust, Save Blind Bay Coalition, and Save the River, Upper River, St. Lawrence Keeper, St. Lawrence River Keeper, excuse me, support CBP in their mission and all they do to protect the border. However, CBP's mission could be fulfilled by operating a new facility at Bonnie Castle Recreation Center with their boat stationed at Key Waden State Park, where they have been moored for several years. See, the river has, long, has a long history of opposing the ill-conceived government agency projects that would in, uh, harm the environment and the river community. John Peach, Save the River's executive director, stated that Save the River considers this issue as important as our founding issue of blocking winter navigation. And we will oppose it with the same level of commitment for protecting the river now and for generations to come. There is bipartisan support at all levels of government for CBP to build their facility at Bonnie Castle Recreation Center. Representative Claudia Tenney and Senator Schumer have been steadfast in their support for keeping the main facility off the riverfront. All levels of local and New York state elected officials led by Jefferson County legislator Phil Reed have been supportive of locating the proposed CBP facility at Bonnie Castle Resort or Bonnie Castle Recreation Center. Excuse me. It's time that the river community prepares itself for another battle with a government agency to protect our fish, wildlife, environment, and everything that is so important to our way of life. This, this situation, <clears throat> excuse me, this situation is unique because Slive Save Blind Bay Coalition and the community are offering CBP a site that is not harmful to the environment and is located at the intersection of Route 12 and Interstate 81, the main thoroughfares that CBP needs to travel to protect the border. Only four of the more than 40 CBP stations along the northern border have water access. Bonnie Castle Recreation Center needs to be listed as an alternative site for CBP's proposed new facility so that it can be properly evaluated. CBP's resistance to this listing is only going to make community resistance to a riverfront site even stronger and more resolute. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Jake Tibbles. I'm the executive director of the Thousand Islands Land Trust. Um, just for those who um, aren't familiar with the land trust, our core mission is on the ground land conservation. So we work with um, government officials, agencies, other nonprofits, partners like Save the River, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, et cetera, um, to place land under uh, perpetual conservation, either through uh, fee ownership in which we own the land or conservation easements. Um, currently, the land trust uh, holds under its uh, purview and protection about 13,000 um, acres. We also focus a lot of our attention and resources um, on uh, land restoration, um, inclusive of uh, wetland restoration, uh, partnerships, again, with uh, Fish and Wildlife and Ducks Unlimited, and then also grassland restoration projects, um, converting either agricultural lands and row crops back to native grasslands. So, 
Um, we also do a variety of, of other um, uh, programming, uh, educational programs, treks, um, outreach, you know, really connecting people back to the land. But our core focus is um, conservation. Um, so I'm just gonna try to be uh, relatively brief on the front end because I know many of you heard uh, my presentation or sat in the presentation uh, this time last year. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I was really hoping not to be here this year, um, but here we are um, and Blind Bay and the proposed uh, Border Patrol facility is still a real threat to, um, as John Peach likes to uh, frame up an environmental gem here in the Thousand Islands. Um, before I get started though, I do want to give um, recognition to both the Save the River and Land Trust staff and board uh, for all of their hard work and dedication over the last two years in staying focused on advancing our various programs, projects, and initiatives, all while staying focused um, on this issue here in Blind Bay. Um, we have enough on our place as it, as it is, uh, but to, to have another um, threat of this scale um, in the river uh, or along the river um, just adds to that stress. So um, thank you, uh, the tilt board and staff and the Save the River board and staff. Okay, so the, the whole Blind Bay issue came into light and focus um, in uh, February of 2022 uh, when the town of Orleans received a letter from Customs and Border Protection um, the letter was an initial outreach to the municipality from a zoning perspective, really to gauge the interest and understanding of the township of how they would react to the proposal um, that CBP was putting forth. Um, that letter went on to basically outline uh, the proposed facility, uh, the nature of the facility, how the operations would um, you know, be undertaken uh, and so forth. Um, as you can imagine, if you look um, here by the, the, the overlay, the aerial overlay, our immediate interest um, in this letter is the fact that the proposed location or what we call their, their primary site um, was immediately adjacent uh, to an existing tilt preserve, which uh, tilt acquired utilizing uh, North American Wetland Conservation Act funding in 2016. Just from a spatial reference standpoint, um, this gives you a little bit of an understanding of where Blind Bay is located with respect to the rest of the Thousand Islands. Um, currently, we are sitting right about here at the Harbor Hotel um, in the village of Clayton. This is Round Island, Grindstone Island. This is TI Park, and um, this is Blind Bay. So, you know, Emma French's video does just an incredible job of capturing all the reasons why Blind Bay is an important ecological um, hotspot here in the Thousand Islands, from our fisheries, muskies, um, the, the 52 other um, uh, fish species that the Thousand Islands Biological Station has documented here, over 30 something years of research. Um, the fact that it is, it is essentially um, uh, a terrestrial highway for a lot of the mammals uh, that we have that reside and call the Thousand Islands home, including fishers, bobcats, coyotes, fox. They actually use Blind Bay um, and the forested uplands as an on and off ramp onto the river, especially in the wintertime. Uh, that's important from an A2A perspective. Um, when the river freezes, unfortunately not this year, but when the river freezes, a lot of those mammals will actually uh, uh, um, you know, migrate at, across the St. Lawrence River and the ice. Um, there's a whole list of New York State spe uh, sp uh, species of special um, concern uh, that reside in Blind Bay and that have been documented through the Thousand Islands Biological Station's research, inc um, including the bridal chiner, uh, the eastern musk turtle, uh, map turtle, um, and then also other species that utilize this property um, that are um, listed, including the northern harrier, metal larks, and, and so on. Um, I did just want to mention um, when we heard uh, Kelly's speech earlier, or sorry, Rachel's speech earlier, you know, 50% of the wetlands across the, the river system have disappeared. And that's just another reason why it's that much more important to save those wetlands and to protect and preserve the wetlands that, that still exist. So you can imagine um, how frustrating it was and perplexed, you know, the community, the river community, organizations like Tilt and Save the River were uh, when uh, the draft EA environmental assessment was released 
uh, finding that there would be um, no significant environmental impacts uh, posed by the facility being proposed by Customs and Border Protection. So just to put that into perspective, I, I felt like utilizing uh, a portion of that initial letter from CBP to the zoning officer in the town of Orleans where he uh, went to, to basically outline exactly what the proposal would entail. You know, looking at about 40,000, 49,000 to 50,000 square feet of um, uh, building space, um, outdoor parking, I wanna say up to 120 uh, vehicles that they were looking for, so impervious uh, surfaces uh, covering that property. Um, support space and infrastructure to include a canine facility. Um, they were gonna have a fuel depot, which was being proposed, uh, marine storage, perimeter fencing, and high intensity lighting, which we have seen um, in full effect at the port of entry. Um, again, just to kind of put that into perspective, um, most of us have probably uh, been to the Price Chopper uh, shopping uh, center uh, right there at the Thousand Islands Bridge. Um, the structure itself, uh, or the Price Chopper shopping center structure itself is approximately 50,000 square feet. That's one contiguous building, um, and the parking space around it is approximately what we would be seeing to accommodate the 120 vehicles that CBP is proposing. So if you can imagine now you kind of pull or tease apart the um, Price Chopper uh, Shopping Center into multiple buildings and then strategically place them across a complex and then um, modify that shopping center uh, to accommodate the operations of uh, an agency that falls under Homeland Security, you really have a facility um, that is just simply not compatible for the shoreline of the St. Lawrence River, let alone an ecological hotspot like Blind Bay. Oh. So understanding the real threat of what was being proposed, um, you know, early on in 2022, um, Tilt Save the River, um, a lot of our community members, you know, folks who just knew what we were dealing with, um, came to the forefront to encourage um, the community's involvement in the public uh, comment period um, during that period, which was part of the draft EA. So um, as part of the uh, NEPA process in which a federal agency has to undergo, um, they have to release uh, what's called a, basically a scoping document or the environmental assessment for public comment. So they do um, certain studies, whether it be archeological studies, avian studies, aquatic studies, um, bat studies on a piece of property that they, are, that they have identified for their facility that they're proposing. They do those studies and then they release them, compile them, and then they release them for public comment. Um, that draft EA, as I mentioned earlier, um, had a finding of no significant impact. Um, the other alarming thing that came to the forefront was that that study was, was a draft study. It was incomplete. It had only looked at the terrestrial aspects um, of, of the Blind Bay site. It did not take into consideration any of the aquatic and or the, um, the, the bat uh, population that was on the property. Um, so uh, within, I would say, three or four months, we had well over a thousand comments that were submitted um, directly to CBP by uh, the river community. Um, then we uh, tilt and save the river, um, along with the support of Phil Reed, who's standing behind me, um, really worked kind of the political end in bringing all of our local officials, whether they're town board members, supervisors, um, uh, uh, local county legislators, uh, Phil himself, uh, Bobby Cantwell, um, and then all the way up uh, through the state, uh, Senator Walzik and uh, Assemblyman uh, Scott Gray, Congresswoman Tenney, and then also Schumer. Um, we navigated that very systematically to ensure that we had the support of each and every one of those elected uh, officials. Um, we actually, on, on Jeff Garnsey's boat here, um, you can see a picture of all of us with, with uh, Claudia Tenney or Congresswoman uh, Tenney. Um, I, I love to, to, to use this uh, question that she has here. Um, and that really captures the essence of, of what um, our thinking was initially uh, when this uh, project was proposed. Um, throughout uh, 2022, um, uh, Tilt and Save the River as part of our uh, uh, community outreach and building public awareness around Blind Bay, um, also as part of just good stewardship of our properties and preserves that we acquire, 
Um, we did a shoreline cleanup, and you can see here all the debris that was picked up out of the bay. I want to say there was several hundred pounds of, of plastic debris, um, construction material, and just things that floated up. Um, uh, this is a picture of, of uh, Tilt and uh, Save the River crew um, with a check uh, for the acquisition. So as part of um, our strategic uh, plan to save Blind Bay, the land trust um, positioned itself early on uh, to actually acquire the property. We really wanted to make a quick move and take um, Blind Bay off the table from an acquisition standpoint. Um, you know, here's Kate Brahaney, our membership coordinator uh, on the kayak, pulling out uh, some debris. And then also, um, as part of the Thousand Islands Biological Station's ongoing research and restoration of the muskie population, um, these were fingerling fries that we um, assisted with the release uh, in Blind Bay. You can actually see here, I'm holding one of my hands. And that's John Farrell himself and Charlie Tebbett, one of our attorneys for the issue. Um, 2022's um, activities um, and, and projects culminated in November when Till uh, formally took possession of the property. Um, we acquired it from Blind Bay Associates, um, utilizing both state and federal funding and us also private funding, um, which came from several folks that are sitting in the audience today. Um, moving into 2023, we continue to push our public outreach campaign, um, expand awareness, um, garner that political support because we knew that we were going to need that as f as we um, uh, further waded into um, the the discussions with Customs and Border Protection. Um, you can see here in the spring of of 2023, uh, again Thousand Islands Biological Station. They have these spike nets or what we call hoop nets. Um, they actually caught a 54 inch gravid female. That's a girth of about 24 26 inches. Um, a, par a portion of her eggs were actually um, uh, obtained, and those eggs were then used as part of the Thousand Islands Biological Station's ongoing muskie um, restoration program. Those eggs were then raised into fingerlings, and then even larger ones, I want to say eight, nine inches, um, over the summer, and then released back into Blind Bay and other sites throughout the Thousand Islands. Um, we also um, held several uh, stewardship events on the property, putting up bird boxes, bat boxes, wood duck boxes, um, and again, building you know, public awareness. Uh, we had several e events scheduled throughout um, the Thousand Islands uh, during the summer of 2023, um, and we formally launched our um, legal defense campaign, uh, recognizing that if we were not able to take Blind Bay off the table, um, then we were likely going to have a long and drawn out battle um, as we proceeded through the NEPA process, you know, costing anywhere from two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand um, dollars just to navigate that issue to get to a final decision. Uh, we also released our um, Save Blind Bay uh, petition, say no to Blind Bay and say yes to Bonnie Castle. I'm going to talk just briefly about Bonnie here in a second. Um, but uh, I want to say in the first six months of the release, we had over 2,000 um, uh, sign-ons. If you haven't already, you know, please uh, do us a favor. Go ahead and grab that C uh, QR code. Yeah, QR code. Um, and now also, I believe, at the tilt table and the Save the River table, there's a couple posters there. Um, we we'd encourage you to go ahead and sign on. So um, as we um, closed in at the tail end of summer, uh, really hoping that um, Customs and Border Protection would kind of hear the, the, the resolution of the, the river community and take a closer look at the Bonnie Castle Rec Center as a viable option uh, for the facility, coupled with um, existing uh, marine access at Key Wade and State Park. Um, and we started to hear um, some back channel rumors that they were starting to, you know, take a closer look at one of those alternatives. Our hope was that it was going to be Bonnie Castle, um, which was proposed by the town of Alexandria. Um, unfortunately, um, they did not. Um, it became clear that Customs and Border Protection was looking at another waterfront location um, uh, located in between the village of Clayton and Blind Bay. Um, what we've referred to is the Dockside Cottages um, study. I'll show you some, you know, the exact location on an aerial. Um, but towards October, uh, this was a, uh, a CBP contractor um, who was out in front of the waterfront section on uh, Dockside Cottages, 
um, doing bathymet well, we, what we believe conducting bathymetric surveys of, of the, the river bottom to understand you know, what type of uh, access they were gonna have to the river. Um, so this is the Dockside Cottages site itself. You can see you've got the waterfront here. Um, this was where I suspect the main facility would be located. Um, again, um, right in the heart of the Thousand Islands, this is Round Island. You've got, uh, I believe maybe Picton back here, TI Park, um, a very high residential area, um, just non-compatible for this type of facility. Um, I, I just wanna go back to this slide because I thought it was interesting. You know, we have been very concerned and um, you know, with what CBP has been doing, looking for additional transparency. And it's just interesting how I noticed that even the river retrievers are concerned. Um, so this gives you just a, another spatial reference. Uh, this is Blind Bay, Round Island, Washington Island, Village of Clayton. Um, this is the Dockside Cottages location. So again, it, it really started to become clear to both Tilt and Save the River um, that Customs and Border Protection was looking to locate this facility um, on, the, on, the, on the near shore of uh, the St. Lawrence River. Um, Blind Bay being an ecological hotspot, having significant um, environmental impacts that would accompany this type of facility, but then also dockside cottages being such a residential area, the socioeconomic impacts that we would see from siting the facility there must be taken into consideration. And I know that neighborhood has really kind of um, galvanized around this issue. And I believe there's another uh, petition out that's got over you know, 750 to 1,000 um, sign-ons also. Um, we believe, you know, at the end of the day that Bonnie Castle is, is still um, the alternative to pursue. Um, we have been working diligently um, week after week to um, encourage our elected officials, um, specifically Congresswoman Tenney and uh, Schumer, um, and now uh, the governor's office. We had a call with the governor's office um, a couple weeks ago and really trying to put into perspective um, the solution that we all have in front of us. Um, and, the, and the case for it, I mean, it's pretty simple. The Bonnie Castle Rec Center, um, it's been you know, left abandoned. Again, this has been put forth in this, um, a briefing document by the town of Alexandria. Um, but when you look here, um, it's been abandoned for uh, about a decade. Uh, the center is uh, conveniently and safely located next to Route 12 and the 81 Cloverleaf. The bridge is right here in case if CBP needs to access um, a Wellesley Island or the, the new port of entry. Um, there's adequate space. You can see here there's several hundred acres that the town of Alexandria currently owns. They need about, CBP needs approximately 20 acres. At least that's what they've stated in their scoping document. Um, that's been outlined here, also identified in the briefing document. Um, there's already municipal sewer and water available. Um, the rec center acreage is already off the tax rolls, so we don't have to worry about another piece of property coming off the tax rolls and shifting that burden as claimed by um, uh, you know, local assessors and town supervisors. Um, there is convenient boat access already at Key Waden State Park. If you go down to the Key Waden Marina, all of CBP's boats, Border Patrol's boats, um, state parks, uh, I want to say state police, all of those boats are already docked uh, in that marina, um, which has occurred, I believe, for the last several years. Um, and then just the further economic development of this area. This um, has really turned into a hub for economic development for the town of Alexandria and the town of Orleans. Um, and, uh, you know, building upon that, especially the, the newly constructed um, uh, welcome center here. So this is really the gateway um, into um, New York State from Canada. This is really where this facility belongs. Um, so just looking ahead, um, we did finally receive a communication, a formal communication from Customs and Border Protection. Uh, this is the first communication that we have received from them since uh, February of 2022. Um, this this uh, letter went out to all of the primary stakeholders involved in this issue. So the local municipalities, Tilt, Save the River, TI Park, um, and some of those that uh, CBP feels uh, needs to be informed. But what's interesting in this letter, um, they clearly outlined that Blind Bay is still a potential site. 
Uh, so they have not taken Blind Bay off the table. They also outlined that they will complete their studies um, on that site. So the aquatic studies, the avian studies, and also the, the bat studies. You can see they've noted here that um, however real estate restrictions, they're talking about us. Um, we acquired the property. We have not let them on the property. Um, so that's ongoing drama. Um, it, it also outlines uh, in an obscure way what we should expect as a community for the process moving forward. Um, again, they're gonna access the property. They're gonna complete the necessary studies. They'll likely have to do that through a legal process. They're gonna continue to study dockside cottages um, and then eventually release, um, it says early 2024, but I believe that's now, um, they're gonna uh, release a supplemental um, environmental assessment um, that will provide us as a community another opportunity to comment um, on those sites. Um, interestingly enough, um, which is somewhat, for us, somewhat concerning, is that they have language in here that suggests that they will consider additional sites that comply or yes, what that comply or compatible with their requirements, which means immediate water access. So essentially how we interpret that is they're gonna be looking for additional sites along the waterfront uh, uh, in the Thousand Islands. Um, really from our perspective, it, this the facility doesn't belong on the waterfront. It belongs at Bonnie Castle if it has to be built. So next steps, uh, continue to advocate listing the rec center as a viable alternative. Um, uh, encourage the governor's office uh, to step in, get involved, engage CBP and work with Congresswoman Tenney um, and uh, Schumer. Uh, this would be a non-political win if we would be able to locate this at a suitable site that isn't impactful to the socioeconomic and environmental fabric of our community. Um, uh, work with elected officials to establish better communication and so on and so forth. Um, I do want to uh, thank the Blind Bay Coalition. Um, much of our efforts, um, connections, and resources would not be possible without the, the group that's been listed here today. Um, so um, if you're a part of the organizations uh, represented on this slide, you know, we, we, we thank you, we appreciate you, um, and we still have, um, we have a fight ahead of us. Um, and then last, for more information, uh, please uh, check out our Save Blind Bay website uh, for ongoing updates and more information um, uh, about Blind Bay and the proposal. Thank you. Thanks uh, to Jake and Rick. Um, well said, <clears throat> it's been two years approximately, and it's been an honor to work with the coalition. Um, and just to let you know, this, uh, it was a weekly thing now it's a daily thing. Everybody's working every day on this. You get calls, texts, emails. We're in constant communication. We, have, we are winning or have won the, the court of public opinion on this. Um, every, there is nobody that thinks it's, this is a good idea. Um, we, and from the political aspect, uh, people along the river pay some of the highest property taxes north of the thruway. Um, we, are, we are for the mission. We understand the mission. We need to keep our borders safe. But to really, this process has been done with you folks, our constituents, in the dark. Um, uh, Freshman Assemblyman Gray was here, spent a lot of time today. Um, uh, Senator Walzik uh, has been available. Um, uh, Representative Tinney's been outstandingly available, along with U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer. Um, and from my standpoint, uh, when Ms. when you pick up the phone and you can talk to these people direct, that that means something. So we got a lot of people behind us. The the one of the arguments that we have too is the New York State Police has excessive has the New York State Police has extensive water patrol responsibilities and so does the New York State uh, Parks Police. They're not on the water. They're, they're, they are on the water physically, but their main operations are not on the water. Oh, why do we need an industrial complex of this nature on the shores of the St. Lawrence River? I don't know of a place in the whole American Narrows where it needs to be. So uh, be assured that this doesn't, <clears throat> nobody's taking any rest with this. 
we're all working very hard and uh it's um it's been a privilege to work with everybody so thank you yeah so uh rick is is asking during the uh public comment period that we believe will be offered up um, under the supplemental environmental assessment will there be an in-person public hearing or comment session here on you know in the thousand islands that's a great question. That's one question that we would like to get answered from Customs and Border Protection. Um, we're in a unique scenario where um, CBP has a great deal of authority and discretion in, in the process. Um, we saw this the, in the initial public comment period back in um, you know, you know, Q1 of, of 2022 where um, public comments were submitted electronically um, and via mail. So. You know, if that's any indication as to how they're going to approach this next round, I would I would say that's probably what we should expect, unless we are able to, um, you know, uh, work with uh, Senator Schumer and Congresswoman Tenney uh, to kind of force that hand uh, to bring a, a public hearing or public comment period here in person in the Thousand Islands. So the question was. Um, in the TI Sun, I believe there was an article that said Customs and Border Protection has taken Bonnie Castle off the table. Um, our understanding is that they have not formally addressed Bonnie Castle at all. It, verbally, uh, with meetings with uh, 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 Claudia Tenney, or in writing to any of the stakeholders or other elected officials. Um, so, unless there is some sort of formal um, document or correspondence that we haven't seen, they just, they have, they have not addressed it. They have not spoken about it. And when the conversations come up, they, they avoid talking about it. They, so I guess you can interpret that. 